So uh, um, I'm going to talk about quality control of, of, of GWAS data. Somebody said before, just as I was getting started, that they were excited about this talk. I'm not sure if that was very sophisticated humor <laughs> 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 or just an unusual preference. But you know, the fact is that QC is a very important part of you know, working with genetic data. If you, as, as Andrea told us yesterday, um, if you don't not careful with your QC, you get results that you can't trust. And we'll actually see at least one example of this. Um, I mean, in extreme cases, it can even lead to retractions. So we'll see one example of this later on in the talk. I will say that um, these problems were especially grave in the early days of GWAS because we hadn't really had time to establish conventions for what works. And you know, in part, we realized you know we figured out what to do through a process of trial and error. And in part, it was sort of by thinking through the underlying principles. Um, and I guess today's talk will be re will reflect that, and that'll be a mix of kind of theory and just practical advice. So, so here's the roadmap. I, I, I want to say some, so, so Andrea talked at great length yesterday about you know, how to get robust genotype data. Um, so I will, I will go through that material relatively quickly. And frankly, she knows a lot more about it than I do. I've only like, QC'd original genotype data once in my life. Um, but I will, uh, I will try to explain a little bit more where the various filters that people tend to apply come from and what they are. And I'll distinguish between variant level filters. So by that I mean a quality control threshold that you apply at the level of the SNP. So for example, if the SNP was only genotyped successfully in 60% of subjects, um, you know, then it might fail our um, core, core filter. And, and then we'll also talk about subject level QC. So it's possible that a SNP does really well, but that there are some subjects where for some reason we don't trust their genotype data, and so we drop them from the, from the sample. I'll very briefly talk about uh, imputation, and then the bulk of the talk will be about um, you know, code level di diagnostics, meta analyses, and post meta analyses QC. Okay? So, why? Um, so, what happens in a typical GWAS? Well, first of all, why do we run, you know, wh why, why, why do we do GWAS, and why do we do GWAS meta analyses in particular? Well, we do them because for most polygenic traits, we need enormous samples to conduct well powered studies. And I'm sure you've already heard a lot about power. I'm sure you'll hear even more about it in subsequent lectures. Um, and if not, you have the badge to remind you. <laughs> so, um, so, so what do we do if we don't have a huge sample? And, and the answer is at a high level is to try to pool data from different sources. But immediately, several problems present themselves. Um, and you know, one practical issue is you might not be able to access the individual level data from all the you know, data providers out there. Um, there are privacy concerns, there are other restrictions that they're subject to. And so what people started doing fairly early on, around you know, mid-2000s, I would say, um, first middle of the first, you know, 2005, 2006-ish is when these conversations, I think, uh, began. Um, they, um, they would ask each individual study or cohort, those terms are sometimes used interchangeably, to run association analyses of some outcome, share the summary statistics with some analysts, the summary statistics are then checked and made to analyze. Okay? And that's, how we, that's what, how we get around this uh, problem. There is, there was, I mean, occasionally you'll hear somebody doing what I, th what I think they call a mega analysis, which just means that you have people upload the individual le level data from all the, from all the um, cohorts on a single server. Um, and then you run the analysis yourselves. And in theory, that allows you to do some additional quality control checks. But in practice, it may, you know, it may reduce your sample size substantially because some cohorts are simply not able to do it. Um, so you know, I would say that uh, empirically, you know, meta-analysis is far, far, far more common than, than any other approach these days. Okay. So how is this done? Well, you design some sort of analysis plan that specifies, ideally, as, many, as fully as possible um, how the desired analysis. So you say, well, what's the association model I want you to run? What's, how do I want you to code your phenotype? How do I want you to impute your data and these sorts of things? The more detailed, the better. Um, and then, of course, it may be that you know, in some cases, um, there are specific issues in a cohort that prevent them from running the exact association model that you had in mind. Or maybe the exact association model you had in mind is not appropriate because of some feature of their data. Maybe they have a lot of sibling data. Or maybe it's a female-only sample, and then you know, obviously you can't control for sex and the regression. So these sorts of little things get worked out. Um, you distribute it to the plan. You specify data for, uh, a date for uploading data. And uh, you also specify required file 
formats. And then these analyses will simply get run. The summary statistics get uploaded to the central server. Um, and then they're checked, meta-analyzed. The meta-analysis results are then checked. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you can start writing your paper. So here's what this looks like graphically. There's, there's a kind of early stage in each study or cohort where you do, you know, you, you, you make sure you have robust genotype data, you do some cohort level QC, you impute the data, you run your association analyses. Um, the results of the association analyses are uploaded in a, you know, in a file. That file undergoes QC, each one individually, and usually there's some back and forth here because it's rarely correct on the first try. These clean study files are then checked um, by, a, by um, at least one analyst, sometimes two analysts check them independently to make sure that they can you know, independently uh, produce the same output. We run the meta -analys analysis, we check that there's nothing funny in the meta analysis results, and then we con declare the meta analysis complete. That's the kind of general um, workflow. Um, so, so Andre already talked about this, um, so, so I, I don't want to talk, I don't want, don't want to go through it uh, in too much, I, you know, I want, I, I, I want to spend just a few minutes on it, but I think it's useful to think about, you know, um, a uh, little bit about where the genotype calls come from, even though most of us don't have a very sophisticated understanding of the biochemistry, okay? And what happened was someone, somebody with Andrea's skills, right, applied a genotype, genotyping algorithm to the output that was generated by, by the probes on some SNP genotyping array. And in the ideal world, the result is something like this. You get three nice, beautiful clusters um, that correspond to the three genotypes. Uh, there are a few missing values. And the proportions here are approximately in, in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So in this case, right, these blues would be called YY. I mean, for some reason, I'm calling you know, this allele Y. These would be uh, heterozygote calls, so, and this would be homozygote. And I'm going to use the conven adopt the convention of uh, letting um, um, uh, denoting missing values by just circles without any colors inside them. Okay, so that's what it should look like in an ideal world. But in practice, there are going to be plenty of SNPs that don't look like that at all. And so to understand the, um, uh, does Grant have a question? Yeah, no. Oh. Um, to understand, you know, where some of these filters come from, you know, we can just, we can make some, uh, uh, you know, we can make up some data and just show um, what kind of errors the filters that we'll talk about momentarily might uh, help us detect. Okay. So in practice, these genotype calls vary substantially, both across SNPs and across individuals in terms of their quality. Um, so now I want to talk about variant level QC. So these are restrictions that basically drop some of the SNPs from the sample for everybody. Okay. Um, okay. So here's just some um, some sort of highly stylized illustrations of what can go wrong. Um, so what's wrong with this? What's, what's wrong with this plot? Anybody? <laughs> but just explain it in words. Yeah, we have way too many people in here, right? So that's, that's very strange. You could imagine some strange world where you have a bunch of homozygotes and each one of them has to breed with a heterozygote. But that happens, you know, in, the, in some breeding experiments in the lab. It doesn't happen with humans, right? So, so if, the, if, the, if the proportions are wildly different from Hardy-Weinberg, then we have, a, we have a problem. And it's usually not going to look this beautiful. <laughs> you know, this is obviously a kind of just an illustration. Um, Here's another uh, issue that can arise. We just don't get clear, we don't get the same, get clear separation. For some reason, we call these as homozygotes and these as heterozygotes. It's not, you know, it's not obvious that we should have a lot of faith in that call. And so we might worry about that. Um, here's an illustration where we just ended up with two clusters instead of three. Sometimes we end up with more than three clusters. So Andre has some actually empirical examples of this. Here's an example where the call rate is low. And of course, you just, sometimes you just get a single blob like this that tells you absolutely nothing. These are just some of the things that can go, go wrong and that the SNP level QC filters are supposed to detect. Okay. Um, so let me, yeah, please. Is, is, is that like neutral colored white color even like another cluster? So these are non calls, just, just the, that's just the convention I applied. So this means, oh, for these people, the genotype is going to be set to missing. Yeah? Oh, okay. We'll talk more about what missingness, I mean, if the missingness is random, right? So sometimes when you hear people talking about QC, they describe the mistakes as sort of random errors, and, um, and therefore, um, uh, you know, I guess the implication is that, um, that you should get rid of them mostly because, um, um, because um, 
um, no, no, not clear why. Like keeping them would not like introduce any systematic biases. The bigger concern is that missingness or the or the um, measurement error in the gene, in the actual calls is somehow correlated with your outcome, and that's when you run into problems and get false pick up false signals that don't really you know, reflect uh, um, a, a true genetic association, rather than due to some technical artifact. We'll, we'll, I'll try to give some examples of how this happens in practice if you're not careful. Um, so now I want to talk about the like the four, I think, uh, main SNP level filters that people tend to um, um, apply. Um, before I do so, I just want to clarify one thing, which is that for some of these um, filters, there is no kind of universal threshold that, you should, that applies to every cohort. Um, and it's a little bit dis difficult to discuss in the abstract what your threshold should be in your specific case. I mean, it really depends on things like your sample size, uh, what's known about the properties of your genotyping array, these sorts of things. So it'll be fairly high level, but hopefully the figures will make clear where the, you know, why, we, why some sort of filter is usually needed. So the first is math filters, so minor allele frequency filters. So SNPs with low minor allele frequency are problematic, especially if you have a small sample, because for some reason the genotyping algorithms do poorly uh, when this is true. It's really the minor allele count, as I understand it, that, that you should be concerned about. Like a math of 0.2% might be fine in the UK Biobank. We have 500,000 people, but it, it could cause problems in substantially smaller sample. Um, so, the, so the main reason you know, that we apply some sort of math threshold is that we're concerned that without it, we're going to get, um, we're gonna get um, you know, our genotyping algorithm just doesn't do very well. And if the errors are systematic, um, then uh, that could create enormous problems downstream. And then there's a second reason, which is that the large samples of approximations that we rely on for inference when we do GWAS tend to become reliable when this number is small. Okay? And that has something to do, I think, with the, with the, 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 the quality of these normal approximations depend one factor is sort of how skewed your variables are. And obviously, you have a lot of skew when, you, when, you know, when, the, when math is small. And you have less skew when 50% you know, are heterozygotes and 25% belong to one of the homozygote groups. So in practice, what people do is they drop SNPs with low math. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, what, what, is it, what does that mean, low math? Well, I've seen thresholds from everything from 0.1% to 2%. And the threshold you should use, uh, one important factor is the, is, is, is the sample size. Um, and next, I want to talk about deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Right? So for each set of genotype calls, we can check uh, for su substantial departures from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And I think there's a question about this on the problem set that tries to clarify the logic here. Sometimes when people see this the first time, they learn uh, that we drop SNPs that are not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, they are a bit surprised, <laughs> and uh, they challenge the decision. So, the, but so, I, so, so, so one thing to make clear is our goal here is to get rid of crazy things like this, where we're confident something get wrong, get, goes wrong. Our goal is not to get rid of SNPs that show a little bit of excess heterozygosity just because you know, there's a sort of mating. Uh, and, uh, you know, unusual, you know, deviate a little bit from Hardy-Weinberg proportions because there's some sort of the mating. Um, does that make sense? So, so the goal here, when you pick your threshold, should be to kind of pick a threshold that doesn't throw out SNPs that, you know, that, sh that, that, who's, uh, that, that, that differ from Hardy-Weinberg proportions a little bit, but you want to get rid of the ones that, where there are clear signs of, of deviations. Um, and that's because they, they tend to reflect genotyping errors. So obviously, Hardy-Weinberg deviations can arise for many other reasons that would be, and that would not be justified throwing out the SNPs. But those kinds of, kinds of deviations should, in most cases, you know, result in just very, very minor um, um, deviations. Yeah? Um, OK. So, so what do we do? Well, we drop SNPs that deviate substantially from Hardy-Weinberg. And the meaning of substantially, you know, again, um, or rather, what kind of p-value this p-value threshold this translates into again depends entirely on n, right? So you know, if you use a p-value threshold of say one percent in UK Biobank, and you might throw out a ton of SNPs that are perfectly fine, but if you use it in a sample of you know a few hundred people, um, you might actually um, you might actually not have been stringent enough in your QC. So so. Um, one way to kind of get it, like if you if you ever find yourself in the position where you have to do the kind of th this kind of um, genotype level QC and you're wondering where to start, one place to start is to look in the sort of 
supplementary materials of previously published papers and see what QC filters were applied in cohorts that resemble yours in terms of the array and in terms of sample size and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, okay, and then the last thing is the, go ahead. Regarding the hardy weimer yeah. equilibrium, so there's this problem that the more uh, significant the SNP is, the more it's been subject to selection and therefore will depart yeah. from Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've heard that before, but I'm not entirely <coughs> sure yet uh, how we uh, deal with that problem. I've heard that sometimes when they're doing the zeros of a binary phenotype, they remove SNPs that are not in equilibrium in, ca uh, in controls, but not in cases. I see. So that's not something I've ever encountered. And my initial reaction, it may be that it's perfectly good. My initial reaction is one of skepticism, because whenever you apply different filters to cases in control, I s I start to worry, yeah, um, I but I, I, it's possible that this is a well thought out procedure and that it's fine. I mean, I, what I would say is that for highly polygenic traits, my guess is that under realistic calibration, the sort of departures from Hardy Weinberg that you would expect to see are tiny compared to the sort of departures that your test should be designed to pick up. Okay. Yeah. So you, you yeah. think that that's not a problem of selection? I, 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 I don't think it's a problem in practice, just like a sort of mating is not a problem in practice, if you just use a reasonable threshold, yeah. And you know, the meaning of reasonable is you have to kind of get, you might have to get there through a process of trial and error and sort of frigging, yeah. It, it's not, um, there's no theory that will just give you the right answer, yeah. Okay, so the next is low call rates. So here, so, so low call rates overall, or differential call rates across cases and controls, if you're doing a case and control study, in a study of a quantitative trait, the analog would be that you know you want to check is the call rate different for people with low and high, you know, with uh, you know, in the below median and above median years of schooling or height or whatever you're studying, right? Um, um, and so, so low call rates or differential call rates can cause problems because they could induce a correlation between your sort of imperfectly measured genotype and the outcome, even if there's no correlation between the true genotype count and the outcome. So if the missingness is random, probably not the end of the world, but often when, when things go wrong, what happened was that the, you know, we had some reason to expect, to suspect that the missingness is correlated with the, with the outcome. And that could be very serious. And I'll give you an example of that uh, on the next slide. So, so what do we do about this? Well, we apply some sort of call rate filter. Um, and in our work, you know, the, the, the call rate filter has been from any, for anything from 90 to 99%. Again, it's very sample size dependent. Um, and you might also drop SNPs if there's a, cl a clear um, um, difference in, um, in the call rate between cases and, and, and controls. Yeah? Um, so, just, yeah. so, so, so now I want to talk about what can happen you know, if you don't do this kind of basic QC. And um, fortunately, you know, serious errors don't, you know, becoming less and less Common, but here is a you know here is a well-known paper that ended up having to be retracted because there were QC issues in the original analyses. Um, so what happened here? Well, the, the original paper was, was a very ambitious paper that genotyped a bunch of centenarians, so people who lived to 100, and then compared them to controls, and basically looked for are there any SNPs where there is different significant differences in the you know, allele frequency between these two groups. That's really what it boiled it down to, um, and the paper ended up. Um, so immediately, shortly after it was published, you know, a lot of, I guess, quantitative geneticists to work on GWAS expressed skepticism. And a lot of that skepticism was based on this Manhattan plot. Um, so let me ask you before I, you know, before we talk a little bit more about what went wrong here, what is, does any, can anybody tell me what is unusual about this Manhattan plot? Yeah. Yeah. I, I see like that top snip yeah. is stand out, then there's less fewer number of like uh, lower tower towers. Exactly. There are no towers, yeah. So why is that why is that why should that set off some alarm bells? Hmm? Because if that was truly a lead snip, the snips in LD with it would also be a lead Right. In theory something like this could happen. You ha you, you genotype this snip really well. For some reason, it's not an LD with anything else, <laughs> but we triple checked everything and the association is there. But in practice, um, as both of you alluded to, 
we expect to see some sort of chimney. That's what happens in empirical data. And the reason is that virtually all of your SNPs are going to have a lot of LD buddies, right? Um, and so when you look at something like this, you, you immediately worry that, uh, that something is off. Okay? Now, let me just add <laughs> that um, um, they've still done a lot of QC. <laughs> if you just run the major analyses without any QC and make a Manhattan plot, you're just going to get an ocean of red all the way up to, I don't know, um, 10 to the negative 20 at least is my, is my guess. Right? So they got rid of a lot of the bad SNPs, but they didn't get rid of all of them, and some of them ended up being uh, significantly associated. Um, so what, what do you think might have happened here? So we talked about batch effects earlier, right? Yeah. So, so if I tell you that the centenarians and the controls were both genotyped on the Illumina chips, but different Illumina chips, what, um, what, uh, what, what do you say? Why might different genotyping chips and bad QC be a bad idea? Yeah? Maybe some SNPs were missing from uh, one uh, array. Uh, so genotyped one best. Yeah, so the concern, right, is that on one array, maybe the genotyping is pretty good, and on the other one, there was some systematic problem. And then it looks like there's a systematic allele frequency. But really, um, what, um, what's happening is that the um, technology is better for one SNP, you know, for on one array than the other in ways that creates a correlation between the measurement error and the, and the outcome. Yeah? Um, so that, that's, and, and you know, very often that, that's what will happen. Like an extreme case would be, you know, in the, in the, in the control group, the, in the intensity plot is just a blob and everybody was called the homozygote. And the other group, it, looks, it just looks like you have these three nice clusters. Then clearly the allele frequency will look different. Now, these errors were not that extreme. I'm sure that their QC took care of, like, or care of the obvious problems. But, um, but it looked like they weren't stringent enough. So what ended up happening was that they had to, uh, the, the, as I understand it, the, the original data raised a lot of skepticism among people who worked on GWAS. Um, and science had to issue a statement of concern. And uh, after the data were reanalyzed with more stringent QC filters, um, most, if not all of these hits went away and they had to retract the article. But I want to emphasize, there's no impropriety here or anything. These, you know, this was just an honest mistake. And these honest mistakes happened quite, com early, quite often in the early days of GWAS. And thankfully now, these days, they're, they're, they're more and more um, rare. Um, OK, so that's, that's uh, variant level QC. Let me say something about subject level QC as well. So just like we don't want poorly um, um, genotype SNPs in our sample, we might also worry that some subjects um, um, should not, you know, we might also want to drop some subjects from our sample. So again, let me walk through the four most common subject level filters and try to provide some justification for them. So they are sex chromosome check, check the genotype call rate, okay? So there's a question yesterday during Andrea's lecture, does the call rate refer to subjects or does it refer to SNPs? And the answer <laughs> that I see when I read papers is that it's not always clear. People typically will impose a call rate filter at the SNP level and at the individual level, so it's important to be clear about which one we're talking about. Okay, we'll, 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 we usually want to drop ancestry outliers from our estimation sample, though increasingly people are in, uh, developing methods that, um, that make this less uh, crucial. Um, and we want to drop subjects with unusual levels of heterozygosity. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these in turn. Well, the sex chromosome check tends to be the most straightforward. I mean, basically what you do is you ha estimate the rate of homozygosity for SNPs on the, on the X chromosome, excluding what's known as the pseudoautosomal region. So what's the pseudoautosomal region? Why, why do we exclude the PAR region? So the reason is that, I mean, it's basically a region of the X chromosome that has some homologue on the Y chromosome. And so, and so, so there's no reason to think uh, a priori that that males are going to be homozygous there. Right? So we just drop that. And, but if, so if we look at the, if we estimate the rate of homozygosity for all the other SNPs, we should get two clear clusters, one for biological females and one for uh, biological males. And we typically sort of identify and drop outliers. And my understanding is that a lot of software like Plink has automated procedures for doing this, but I, I couldn't tell you the exact cutoffs for the, 
uh, from the top of my head. Another sort of common sense thing to do here, if you have other information about bi bi biological sex, maybe from a survey question, and there's a, um, um, and it doesn't agree with the, um, with the um, um, uh, classification based on the, um, on the um, um, homozygosity rate, then you should at least consider dropping the observation if you think there's a, pro there's a reason to suspect that the sample has been you know, uh, uh, assigned the wrong identifier or something like that. Um, OK, so what about um, excess heterozygosity, or just heter you know, unusual heterozygosity you might write? And people have different takes on this. But why, why so, 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 so what do we do? Well, we estimate the rate of heterozygosity across all SNPs. So there's a standard sort of test statistic that, that, um, that, you, can estimate, that, you, that can, you can produce for each subject. And then you look for outliers. And usually, one thing I should emphasize, Often it's a good idea to do this graphically. Just look at the data because the meaning of an outlier might depend, vary across samples. Identify them and typically drop them. Why, why, is, like, why is an outlier heterozygosity rate worrisome from the point of view of genotype? And what might have gone wrong in that case? Anybody? Are there any wet lab people in here? What happens? Yeah? What, happens if, what would happen to the heterozygosity rate if I mixed two samples by accident? Oh. Yeah, it would go up. Yeah, that's the idea. So if you see somebody with a ton of heterozygosity, maybe what happens is that he got commingled with something else, and, and really, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not um, accurately measuring this person's genotype. So, so that's why we have this filter. Go ahead. Why would it do that more than just if those two people like, had a child? Wouldn't there be the same amount of heterozygosity if you just mixed their samples? So if you and I, so take, so let me try to, see, to explain how I think about it, and you can tell me if you don't agree. So suppose that, take a SNP with minor allele frequency of 50%, so we should expect roughly 50% heterozygotes and 25% homozygotes. Now suppose that my, I'm genotyped and you're genotyped. Now it's much harder for us, for the, and we, but the samples become contaminated. Now the, homo, the, the rate of, of, of uh, homozygosity should drop because the only way for it to stay the same is if you happen to be AA and I'm AA, which of course is a less likely event. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's often a sign of, of contamination. Now, um, yeah. So some 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 QC protocols I've seen they just drop um, subjects whose heterozygosity rates are too high. I've also seen some some protocols that kind of handle it symmetrically and, and drop you if it's if it's too low. Um, so the latter is, it's less obvious to me what the justification for it is, because it just could just be that you have some inbreeding in the sample or some stratification or something like that. Okay, then the last thing is, is ancestry outliers, yeah? So, so typically, <laughs> we, well, I think we'll t we haven't talked about PCs yet, but we'll talk about them. Oh, we have, we thought, perfect, okay. So typically, we want to estimate these PCs in a sample of approximately unrelated individuals. And, and during the break, Raymond gave me the intuition for why we want to do this. The basic intuition is if we had a lot of family data in there, if you had every member of the Chesterini family, one of the PCs would just capture you know, that family history. And that's not what we're looking to control for, right? So if you have an uncle and the niece or something like that in, in their, uh, and their nephew, it's not a big deal, but, but you should aim for something like this. Um, so you, you, um, you estimate the first couple of PCs um, typically, um, and then you look for outliers um, um, that, you know, on, on, on the first, say, five to ten PCs. And one rule I've seen is you, you know, estimate the PCs until they're no longer significant and then stop and look for outliers on the significant PCs. It seems kind of ad hoc, but maybe that's one way to proceed. Um, the key thing is to get rid of, um, if you want to do some standard type GWAS association analysis, the key thing is to drop the outliers. So why is that important? Why might it be a good idea? to drop ancestry outliers from your estimation sample if you're going to do a conventional GWAS. Anybody? So, so my mother's Italian. I grew up in Sweden. In the 60s, there was a wave of sort of blue-collar immigration to Sweden. Suppose that we gather a bunch of data in Sweden. We get some Italians in the sample. Um, why, what's the justification for potentially dropping the Italian Swedes? What, what, why might we want to do that? Yeah? It might be difficult to 
Yeah, we worry that in a heterogeneous sample, we're going to need really good controls for, you know, if the outcome is um, education, then we worry that maybe there are other things about this Italian people, you know, they came to Sweden more recently, their parents are not going to speak the language fluently, et cetera, et cetera. So there might be other factors <laughs> that, um, that we need to control for before we, you know, before it's um, reasonable to include them in the analysis. We might ha not have those ca uh, factors measured very reliably. Um, and then so, you know, any SNP where, you ha where there happens to be an allele frequency difference between Swedes and Italians is going to show up in your analyses. Okay? But we would not be very confident in such a result if we kept, the, kept them and all the hits were hits, were, 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 were SNPs were, where there are frequency differences between Swedes, um, Swedes and, and, and Italians, okay? or Northern Europeans and Southern Europeans. Um, so, so often it's a good idea to try to conduct these association analyses in a genetically um, homogenous sample. You know, it's, it's one way to address concerns about uh, stratification. Um, yeah. So this is another way of making Dan's point that it's not enough to just take a bunch of people who kind of self-identify with the same race and say, okay, no, there's no stratification now. Um, often you'll have a lot of stratification even within sort of broadly defined groups like that. Um, okay. Well, then the last thing to do is you often want to just look at the relationship information within your data. And it's a little bit hard to point to one reason why this is a good idea. It turns out there are a lot of little ways in which it could be useful. <laughs> so, um, so let me just give you a couple of them. Maybe you can think of more. So if you have some ma matrix with the relate, pairwise relatedness between all the subjects in your sample, what can you do with it? Well, in QC, you can do it, use it to identify Mendelian errors. Um, for example, and we talked about this earlier, children should inherit exactly one allele from each parent. If you see in the data <laughs> that, uh, some, you know, that at one of the SNPs, uh, a child was, uh, has a genotype call that's impossible, given what we know about the parental genotypes, probably we want to do something about that. You know, identical twins should have identical genotypes. Um, if we see in the data that a pair classified as monozygotic, um, um, you know, are um, genotypically discordant at 2% of the loci, we probably don't want to keep those calls, etc. We might also identify duplicates, you know, non-twin um, non -twin individuals who have the same genotype uh, data, and then clearly there's been some sort of mix-up or problem with the, with the um, identifiers. Um, there are also other, th other advantages to just identifying other um, unknown relative pairs. The first comes up when we estimate these PCs that we usually want to uh, use to detect ancestry outliers. Um, when we estimate the PCs, we, we want, for reasons we discussed, we want to do this in a sample of approximately unrelated individuals. Um, and the second thing is that if you have some um, relative pairs in your data set, and then you run an association analysis without taking into account potential correlation um, in the errors between members of the same, same family, your standard errors are not going to be exactly right. So you, 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 the family information even if you choose to keep uh, plenty of, you know, previously unknown relative pairs in the data, um, they're going to give you, um, uh, you know, they're going to allow you to um, run an association model that gives you more accurate standard errors. So those are just some of the ways in which relationship information could come up. Okay. Let me see. Okay, we have time. So, so um, I. I don't want to say much about imputation because it already came up yesterday. And for our purposes, you know, the key thing to emphasize is that when we combine data from all the cohorts, different SNP arrays uh, measure, chose to different very, choose to measure very different SNPs. And even when there's overlap in the SNPs across arrays, they might not use the same identifiers uh, for them. So we want to both make sure that we know how to map each array level SNP identifier to a common um, identifier. Um, and we want to be able to um, get better coverage in our meta-analysis. What we do before meta-analysis, we, we ask all the coaches to impute against the common reference um, um, uh, genotype. Um, and that reference genotype basically defines a, uh, an identifier for each SNP. Um, and uh, that way, you know, it might be that if we just have two cohorts and one of them has 500 genotype SNPs, the other one has, another, has a million, but the overlap between the two is only 100,000, right? So just meta analyzing those 100,000, we would lose a ton of information. But among the 500,000, we're going to be able to impute um, 
quite accurately, you know, most of the common variation across the genome. We can do the same on the second SNP array. And now we are no longer limited to doing our meta analyses uh, for a small number of SNPs. We can do it with pretty good coverage across the entire genome, and that's going to boost our power to detect association. So in other words, a naive meta analysis that's just limited to SNPs that we found in all the arrays is not going to it's going to be extremely inefficient because you can just throw out lots of useful information. Okay? So imputation, for our purposes, the main point is that it boosts power by allowing us to make and analyze a, a larger number of SNPs that cover the, um, uh, the common variation across the genome much more um, comprehensively. Okay. And, and imputation, uh, I certainly don't claim to, be <laughs> to have any deep insights into this, but, but there's a Marcini and Howey paper from 2010 that explains the basic principles quite nicely and um, you know, the way they, the, 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 key, um, the key thing that's useful for you to know is I think it, it, is that the, you proceed in a number of steps, steps. The first is phasing, basically determining whether um, which allele you got from your mother and which you got from your father at each um, um, data point, each SNP. And why is that important? Well because once you have that information you can see, oh, these were my etern maternally inherited alleles. And then you can use sequence data to see if you can figure out which haplotype it's likely to have come from. So that's how imputation works. You have some sequence data. And then you have gene SNP data where there's lots of missing information. But you see, which, you know, for each person's, um, from each person's genotype data, you try to figure out the underlying uh, haplotype. Um, and that way you can. You can, you can go from just the SNP data to having some, you know, a much richer set of um, um, uh, yeah, imputed data. And I think, um, I think the, the figure Andre gave was these days you get maybe 10 million SNPs imputed. So that's after some fairly stringent QC. If you just use one of the standard imputation tools these days, you might, might output as much as 40 million. But my experience is perfectly consistent with Andrea. Once you apply reasonable QC filters after imputation, you're left with roughly 10 million. That's, that's my, I'm sure if there's somebody on YouTube watching this in five years, they'll laugh at us because the number will have changed. But my, my feeling is it's about 10 million right now. OK. Um, OK. So yeah, OK. So, so one, one, I just want to say something about imputation accuracy. So imputation can be done with different softwares. Um, they all produce some sort of SNP level metric that tells you how accurate was the imputation. The exact meaning and interpretation of these vary across softwares. If you're interested, there's a paper on the reading list by Winkler that has some uh, discussion and recommended thresholds depending on the software you use. Um, the, um, the one point I would make is that I think, I think that the, the, the most softwares produce an, out, an output metric that's supposed to be interpretable as like the, the R square from, that you would get if you regressed the true genotype on the imputed genotype. Okay, so that is basically um, uh, it's a very intuitive measure of uh, a way of measuring imputation quality. Uh, and these days, I think we do most of our imputation on this, on this server. Um, so if you haven't heard about it, you might want to um, check it out. It automates a lot of the, of, of the tricky steps. And I think we found that it works uh, pretty well. Um, you, do have to be, uh, you, ha you do have to be have permission to upload your genome type data to the server. Uh, they, do, they destroy it afterwards, but, but provided, you have, so provided you have permission to upload it, uh, we, we found that it's a good um, tool. OK. So when something goes wrong in imputation, what is it typically that, that happened? Well, maybe there was poor QC of the original genome type data. The second issue of strand alignment, and that has to do with whether the SNP is measured on the forward strand or the reverse strand. So a SNP that's measured. So suppose a SNP is GT on the forward strand. Then we know that on the reverse strand, it's going to be CA. The problem ar arises for these strand ambiguous SNPs that are, um, um, that are AT or TA. And there it's not possible to infer uh, just from the, from the um, you know, if we go back to these figures we started with. Yeah, we're not sure if what's being shown here is the nucleotide intensity on the forward strand or the reverse strand. We can always figure it out, except for these potential, sometimes for these strand ambiguous SNPs. Um, now, even there, you can figure it out, I think, if you have some LD information from a reference data set. But in practice, things go wrong here. And I, I don't fully I, like, understand why it seems like if you're, if you're careful, it shouldn't happen. 
Um, but, but there might be subtleties that I don't uh, appreciate. Um, I know for a long time the way people dealt with this problem of strand alignment is they just, uh, for the ambiguous SNPs, is they just, um, they just base it on allele frequency. And that might be fine if the allele frequency is 10%. But once you get closer to 50, it's easy to imagine that the forward strand frequency is 45% in one code and 52 in the other. And then you're going you're gonna to flip the sign. Um, and third is that you didn't rely on a common imputation reference panel. There's an issue with the, you know, your, your, um, the crosswalk that you used to map your, um, the identifiers in your original genotype data to the, some common reference panel. OK, so then we're ready to run GWAS. And Dan already talked about this. So we, we regressed some outcome on a vector of controls and some variable that, loosely speaking, is the number of reference alleles, 0, 1, or 2. And we do this over and over again, maybe 10 million times, maybe a little bit more. Um, this is done in each cohort. And the cohort then uploads a results file that had, t tends to have this um, sort of um, format. So the first is a SNP ID. So this is, um, um, this is, the, this is the RSID of the SNP. But more importantly for our purposes is that we have a chromosome number and then a position. And the chromosome number and the position in the reference sample is what uh, identifies the SNP. Yeah? Um, then you'll typically specify a coded or reference allele. You'll specify what the other reference allele is. You'll, you'll provide the effect size estimates, some standard errors, um, p-value of association, and these sorts of things. Yeah? So, so each cohort uploads something like this. They also upload a spreadsheet just with some basic information about well, how big was our estimation sample? What was the standard deviation of our uh, variable in it? Um, what fraction was female if we asked for sex stratified analyses? Um, how did you code your phenotype, et cetera? We might also provide some information about the genotyping, about imputation, what QC was done prior to imputation, and what do you put in this vector Z. Yeah? So when I said at the outset we specified in the analysis plan what should goes into Z, um, I wasn't lying to you, but in practice, um, you know, the, what's appropriate sometimes varies a little bit across cohorts depending on you know, the, the specific circumstances. OK, so you get this file. And then there's some just common sense checks that you could do. And I, I do want to, I'm, I'm, you'll probably hear me say this again, but I, I think a very important part of QC is just looking at the data and checking basic commonsensical things. I can't tell you the number of times that doing so or failing to do so you know, cost, us, cost you hundreds of hours of work. It turns out that it was something very basic that was causing the problem. So you want to check that there's two alleles that they're claiming in, their, in, the, um, in the uploaded file. The reference, the coded allele and the other allele are the same as in the reference file. If they're not, we, hopefully it's just a matter of realigning them. Maybe they just um, flip them in some cases. Uh, but sometimes there are deeper problems going on. Um, you want to check that the information in the results files matches the descriptive. So if they say, Oh, in our female GWAS, we had 6,021 people, and in the male one, we had 6,022. But then in the results files, it's flipped. Then you want to double check that the results files labeled male is actually the male one and not the female one. You want to check some commonsensical things, like that the Z statistic is equal to what you get if you divide the, standard error, uh, the coefficient by the standard error. You want to check for duplicate SNPs, missing chromosomes, etc. Yeah, You want to check that the Nobody is reporting results for chromosome 79 or something absurd like that. <laughs> yeah? um, and then the next step is to just look at the data, the, the cohort level data. And, we, and oh, Winkler is out, so the giant consortium has study height and body mass in index and I think waist to hip ratio, just anthropometric traits. They've developed a very nice kind of protocol. And a key part of the protocol is kind of these kind of diagnostic tools for looking at the data. And so they, they just, they, um, and what I'm going to show you is slightly you know, adapted versions of these plots. Um, so I'm going to talk about p-value versus z-statistics plots. So these basically just check that the p-value for SNP k, which is given in the p-value column, is roughly equal to the p-value that you would inf uh, guess based on the, on the uh, z-statistic. The allele frequency plot compares the allele frequency distribution in your estimation sample to the reference samples. The QQ plot looks for evidence of anomalous inflation of p-values. And then what we call the standard error versus sample size plot um, uh, basically compares to your reported standard errors. So there's one would project under some assumptions that I think 
I think you calculate the approximation formula on the, on the, on the problem set. Okay. So here's an example of something looks funny in the PZ plot. Um, so cohort originally uploads something like, that, that looks like this, and then there's some back and forth with the analyst, and eventually you get something like, like this. The reason that something like this can happen, I mean, it could be something as trivial as um, um, there was just, they upload, they show you the wrong variable in the p-value column. Usually then this whole thing will, be, will look dark and, and uh, it's because the p-values are all, all, all over the place. Usually it has to do something with, with, usually something like this arises because there was some issue with the, um, um, uh, with the, the uh, with some maximum likelihood estimates that failed to converge, and then the software resorted to some alternative uh, procedure for generating standard errors. And in general, we found that um, in such cases, it might just be better to to drop the SNP all, altogether. Okay, but there are many many reasons why some why the PZ plots could come out funny. Um, okay, so these and now what about the AF plots? Well, these are from Win the Winkler's out paper. I've just copied them. Um, Okay, so what's wrong with the first one? So hopefully you're all thinking, what is he talking about? Because the first one looks great, yeah? The, oh, yeah. <laughs> the allele frequency in the, in the reference sample aligns very closely with the allele frequency in the, in the uh, estimation sample. And I would say that's also true for B. Like this cigar-shaped thing is, is something you would um, uh, expect when your estimations, when there's some ancestry, you know, um, differences between your estimation sample and your um, and your reference sample, but but th this kind of this kind of um, um, these kinds of differences I, I would not find too alarming. And the third one is an example from an actual giant data of what it looks like when the um, um, when the original estimation sample differed quite substantially in terms of ancestry from the from the reference sample, and that might be an issue for the reason we we talked about, you know. Um, if, if the goal was to run the association analyses in ethnically homogeneous um, samples, um, then uh, um, seeing this uh, might be a little worrisome. Okay. Now let's look at some AF plots that might reveal even, yeah, let's look at some other things that can go wrong with AF plots. Um, okay, so what happened here, anybody? Yeah, and in some sense, this is actually, this is not so bad if you're an analyst. You look at this and you realize they just reverse coded the, the uh, effect allele every time. So we just need to switch two of the columns and we're done, right? What about this and this? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is more worrisome. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if we're lucky, it's just that they, you know, on the odd chromosomes, they reverse coded the allele frequency or uh, the effect allele or something. So, but in, in practice, it's likely to be something more uh, serious, they might have to re-impute, you know, who knows. It's impossible to tell just from this, but we do know that there's a problem and that we absolutely should not proceed with the, res with the results file that looks like this, yeah? Okay. Um, all right. And then there's a funny one. I left that one out. There's one that's just completely blue where some, it's also from real data, but I don't know. I, I'm sure that can happen. Um, okay, so QQ plots. Let me just say... So, so, um, so these are QQ plots. These QQ plots that I'm showing you here, there's not necessarily anything wrong with them. I have some bonus slides where I talk a little bit about how this lambda GC measure is defined and that you can look at. The key thing, um, the key thing about QQ plots is that they need to be judged keeping sample size in mind. Yeah? So a QQ plot that deviates from the, the, from the null. So what are we showing here? Well, we're showing the, p value, the empirical p-value distribution against the one we expect under the null when none of the SNPs are associated. And so the fact that we see some liftoff here, um, meaning we see more low p-values than we would expect under the null, is not necessarily a problem if this QQ plot was produced by a huge cohort like UK Biobank. We, and we're happy to see that there's no early liftoff. Um, um, in practice, but, but in practice, it's it's um, um, this is part science, part art, because because it's really sample size dependent, and the relationship between between um, you know the kind of QQ plot you should expect and the sample size, it's uh, you know 
Yang and Vishra have some work that I cite in the bonus slides that try to work this out, but it's not that it can be summarized in a, in a sentence or anything like that. So just be aware that this, this, this QQ plot, if it came from a cohort of 2,000 people and, um, um, and you know, the outcome is something moderately heritable and very polygenic, it should raise alarm bells because we don't expect a bunch of genome-wide significance hits in such a small sample ordinarily. If it came from UK Biobank or 23andMe or some very large sample, it's probably completely fine. One thing to look out for on these QQ plots that you'll sometimes see, so sometimes you see very early liftoff in a small cohort, that's a problem. Um, another thing you might see is like some crazy low p-values, like oh I have a hit at 10 to the negative 65, okay? Usually those will go away if it's a small cohort, if you just apply a strict their minor allele frequency filter. It has to do with this uh, you know, the, the quality of the normal approximation not being very good, I think, in, in these cases. And if it looks like this, it's probably great. You know, unless you got this from UK Biobank, in which case you should be worried. Why am I not seeing any signal here? Yeah? So the point is QQ plots. In the early days of GWAS, if you go, you go back to the papers on the reading list, I think that the thinking on how to interpret them has changed a little bit as we realize just how polygenic things are. Um, and, 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 you know, just what kind of departures from a QQ plot you should expect on the polygenicity under different uh, sample sizes. Okay, and then, uh, oh yeah, please. Can go back to the of course. Uh, why is early liftoff a problem? Um, early liftoff is a problem if you have a small cohort where you don't expect to be picking up very many signals. Um, um, or you, but you see, um, um, and, and yet the kind of the median p-value is, is lower than it should be under the null, then that suggests there's a problem with your standard errors, yeah? Like, I mean, it's a, I'm not sure if that's the clearest of answers, but, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a stupid question, but no. every series that I've seen kind of looks like that, uh, with large samples, right? Yeah. Uh, where, you know, initially you're in the, on the 45 degree line, and then you get this. Yeah. Uh, by, I'm just wondering, why don't we see something like a U? So at the bottom of the distribution, you might think that there are a bunch of SNPs whose association is effectively zero. Yeah? So, there, so, um, so, so those, irrespective of the sample, you shouldn't see any inflation at like the in the bottom deciles, maybe. If, but if every SNP is associated, right, and you run a GOS in 50 million people, then in principle, you could have, a, I think, a QQ plot that shows inflation everywhere, and that needn't be an, a problem. Um, in practice, though, if you see a liftoff, I've found that it r means that there's some pr issue with the standard errors. That's, that's kind of, yeah. Uh, in practice, or sorry, it just to, like help me uh, better conceptualize these. So if you had something that was like only determined by it or only associated with a few genes, yeah. uh, it would be mostly flat and then have just like a... Exactly. That's okay. it. And that was the thinking when they came up with these tools. To, uh, well, well, when they sort of... Um, when they advocated for these tools to be used widely in GWAS. The idea was, well, there are a couple of G SNPs. The median SNP is never going to be associated. And so, and so that, that, that I, I think that, so, so, so we, should, we should see something that's flat. And then, you know, we detect a couple of things like that at the top. That's what they thought the ideal uh, QQ plot should look like. But given now <laughs> what we now know about architecture, you know, there's just no reason to expect that to be true. Yeah. Okay. So, so the last one is uh, the last kind of set of um, diagnostic figures that I'll show you are based on this approximation that you derived on the problem set. And um, I also have some bonus slides that I think drive this using a slightly different approach, but obviously the answer is the same. And the idea is that we can take the standard errors in the data that were uploaded, uh, okay, and we can compare them to these projected standard errors. So how do we project the standard errors? Well. We project them from our knowledge of the standard deviation of y, from the sample size that we use to estimate the effect of SNP k, and from 2 times math times 1 minus math. So what is, th what is this equal to? Very good, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's the variance of the, um, of the allele count, right? So, um, so of course, this is an approximation. Um, in the bonus slides and in the problems that you work out, I think you work through a problem that I think helps you understand where the approximation comes from. Let me just list some important assumptions underlying the approximation. 
The first is that this vector z explains only a small share of variation in y and in x. Um, and that may or may not be true. Like if you run a GOS of height and one of your controls is uh, biological sex, then, you know, then z is going to absorb a good chunk of the variation. And what, mean, what that means is that this is not a very good proxy for the standard deviation of the residual, which is what we ideally care about. Um, we need Hardy Weinberg in order for this variance um, term to be, to, to be exact. Um, we need the imputation uncertainty to be low. Um, so what happens if the, if the, if the imputations, if, if, we if, if we use this projection, projection for a SNP that was very poorly imputed? Well, think about imputation uncertainty is something that's generally going to say, instead of say, saying, oh, this person is a homozygote, we're going to say, well, there's an 80% chance that she's a homozygote and maybe 20% of being heterozygous. And then um, you know, the dosage in this case will be 0.8 times 0.2 times 1. So you get the number less than 2, even if the true genotype count is 2. So you get some compression of the variance um, that, uh, that means that this is not an accurate estimate of the, of, the true, of the variance of the actual variable that you're using. Okay, and then there's this IID assumption. Well, this, I, I mean, yeah, this is an OLS standard error that's correct if they run OLS and if the, and if the residuals are IID. Um, okay, so let's look at some plots and what they can reveal. Um, so, and I, by the way, I should, say, I should thank Tanner and Harry, who's not here for help with making these figures. So, so what is, um, so here, here are some simulated data where we plot the predicted standard error against the actual standard error. This line is the prediction you get from the approximation formula. And this line is the prediction you get from the uh, approximation formula, assuming a standard deviation of one. So here, clearly, we assumed a standard deviation greater than one. Okay, so what do you think about this? Uh, any alarm bells ring off when you look at this? Looks pretty good, right? I mean, it looks like, if anything, it looks too good to be true, um, right? Now, um, sometimes what you'll see is, and by the way, I don't recommend making these plots with 10 million SNPs. It's gonna take you a long time. You'll, you'll get exactly the same answer if you just pull out 100,000 at random and plot it, yeah? If there are problems, you're going to see them in 100,000 SNPs. Um, sometimes what you'll see is like some very strange outliers. Um, and in such cases, what I've found is useful to do is just look, go to those SNPs and see if they cluster. And sometimes what you'll see is they cluster on some tight you know, region on the chromosome. And what's going on is typically that this, that this assumption fails. Basically, we have a, some small region of a chromosome where z explains a lot of the variance in x. And how could that happen? Well, it happens if you have an x that loads very heavily on one of the PCs. So then if you re regress the x on that PC, a lot of the variance disappears yeah, in, in x. You, you're left with very little identifying variation in x, and that's going that's gonna, to that's gonna make your uh, standard error shoot up. Yeah? Um, OK. Now, what if they came back like this? What would you say? So the standard deviation of the variable, we know in, from the descriptives that it's equal to 4, say. Um, but it looks like the data fits a model where the standard deviation is 1. So what do you think happened? Why might the standard deviation be 1? Oh, sorry, was there, some, was there a guess? Was there an answer? So... So it's the difference between standardized and unstandardized regression, right? So probably what happened was they standardized their dependent variable before analysis, but they didn't tell you about it. Does that make sense? So if, if years of schooling has a standard deviation of four, um, and I run my association analysis with years of schooling, we should get something, uh, standard errors that sit on top of this line. The fact that we're seeing standard errors that sit on this top of this line probably means that they just divided everything by four and then ran the same association analysis. Is that a serious problem? Does it change the p-values or anything? No, right? So it's not a serious problem unless, unless uh, we don't catch it and uh, unless our plan is to do inverse variance weighted meta analyses. And in that case, it's going to be an issue. So this kind of thing is not a big deal. 
It just means that um, you know, we can either just rescale the estimates by hand using the information in the descriptors, or we could tell them, please rerun, and, and please don't standardize the phenotype before you do the analysis. Here's another example. So it's, it, I mean, it looks good, right? Um, the only issue is that there's more um, uh, variance around the, around the prediction. Um, this is something that can happen if you have a lot of, um, if you didn't have a very tight imputation accuracy filter, yeah? Then you might get, then you might get um, uh, some, you know, more variability. So some SNPs are just poorly, not, not imputed very well, and their standard errors are gonna, um, systematically differ. Okay, here's one more. This might, you know, this, this one, this is an example of, of, of standard errors, of something that we might worry about a little bit more. So here, uh, though it could be fine, I mean, we, we'll, dis we'll discuss that. Here's the prediction, here's what we found. So we systematically get greater standard errors than what we, um, um, than what we expected. Now maybe that's fine. Maybe this was just a twin cohort. They didn't run over less. They had a bunch of twins whose errors are correlated. They accounted for that correctly in their association analysis. And that's why you get standard errors that are bigger and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, but if it was a cohort of unrelated and they claimed that they ran over less, probably what happened is that the standard deviation in the descriptives doesn't match the standard deviation in the estimation sample. I mean, it looks like the standard deviation or whatever they analyzed in their GWAS was bigger, okay? Now, that might be due to some trivial issue, like, oh, this standard deviation was incorrectly calculated, but in some cases, it could be like, indicate a really serious problem. Like, we had one case where the standard deviation was inflated because missing values were coded in negative 99, and, um, but the association software didn't know that this was not a numerical entry, and so you ended up running just a nonsense regression and we were able to figure it out because we could calculate, well, how much would numerical coding of the missing value inflate the standard deviation? And what would it look like if, and, and you know, it, it turns out that if you made that adjustment, it fit the data perfectly. So that's the explanation. Obviously, we have some problems to deal with. Here's another example where the standard errors, um, the actual standard errors are too low. Um, okay, and you know, again, th this could reflect serious issues, but it could also just be as simple as, oh, we had a set of Z's in our regression that explained a good chunk of the variance, and therefore, this is a substantial overestimate of the standard deviation of epsilon, which is what we want. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, like, these are all from a simulation. Yeah. Your, your, the error around, like, where the data seem to go is, is quite tight. Right. Here. In practice, is it actually tight enough that you can distinguish between these different lines? Depends on how grave the error is. And I don't doubt that there are errors that go undetected. I don't doubt that for a second, yeah. And that's an important point. I mean, if you do a mate analysis with 200 cohorts, um, it's very likely that, un that there will be some errors that creep through and that go undetected. So, in, but in terms of Patrick's question, this is not a completely unrealistic picture of what some cohorts look like. But in others, the inflation is greater. And I think a lot of that has to do with how they if the association software handles imputation uncertainty and these sorts of things, and also what imputation uh, quality threshold they used before analysis, yeah. Okay, so then there's some more pre meta di diagnostics you can, we can look at. Yeah, we have 10 more minutes, so I think it's perfect. So if you have a large cohort, one very useful thing to do, if you have a suitable reference cohort, suppose you have data from UK Bio, one of the cohorts is UK Biobank or 23andMe, and you've checked those results and you're confident in them, one thing you can do when, when the next cohort uploads their results is estimate the genetic correlation between this cohort and the reference cohort, so 23andMe, say. So why is that a good idea? What does estimating that genetic correlation tell us? Um, and you know, what, what kind of problems might it help us detect? So what do you do? What, so what if the genetic correlation, oh, please. It could be an index of, of heterogeneity. Yes, it could be an index of heterogeneity. And that's true, and it's been used that way. But suppose I find an estimate of negative 0.9 with a standard error of 0.2. What, what should I conclude? Something was reverse coded properly. Exactly. It's about reverse coding. Now, you can't do this in cohort with a couple of thousand people and a phenotype with modest heritability. But for cohorts with, say, you know, 10,000 people or more, this, this is going to be pretty informative. And you're hoping for a genetic correlation that's you know, closer to 1 than negative 1, and ideally positive. Yeah. Um, of course, there are 
and, and Raymond will talk more about this and, and, and how it works and under what conditions it's, you know, it doesn't perform very well. But, but I found that in most of our cohorts we can do this analysis and it's informative. If you're lucky enough to study a phenotype where there are previously established genetic associations, um, you could also take, say, the top 100 and just check how often the signs align in your data, um, um, in, in your data. The, how often is the direction of the association the same? And here the hope is that it'll be a number greater than 50%. And if it's significantly lower than 50%, then we worry again about reverse coding. So there's sort of two independent ways to detect reverse coding. Of course, reverse coding is not going to be an, is very unlikely to be an issue if the outcome is something like height or education, because uh, it's very hard to imagine a setting where an analyst accidentally runs the regression on you know, negative education. <laughs> but, but for things like a depression index, it might be that some of the items are positive, you know, po po positive items and some of them are about negative feelings. And you have to be careful you know, whether you add them up so that you get an index that's increasing in somebody's um, uh, depression or in, in, uh, increasing in you know, how, oops, increasing in the, um, um, the opposite of their, you know, increasing in their happiness levels or whatever, whatever the correct term is. Um, okay, so the other thing to do is I think just tabulate the number of SNPs dropped in each QC step, do this by cohort, and make sure that there's nothing that stands out to you as odd. And if something is an anomaly, just make sure you understand it. Um, understand you have an explanation. And if you don't, can't come up with an explanation, Talk to, talk to the cohort about it. And then there are a bunch of things that you can do with the um, cohort level diagnostics. And I'll just give you one example from Winkler et al. That what they suggest is plotting the, this lambda GC, um, inflation um, descriptive statistic, against some um, sample size or square root of sample size or something like that. And here again, the point is not, um, point is not, we should expect, we should actually expect a positive relationship here. I'm actually surprised that uh, we don't see more of a positive relationship than we do. But the main issue is we want to look for strange outliers. Like if all the cohorts who's um, with a sample size around, uh, you know, a thousand or so have lambdas around here except for two, then we should be very suspicious of the standard errors in these two anomalous cohorts. And indeed, that's what Winkler et al., you know, these are the pre-QC um, plot, and this is what happened after they resolved the issues with the cohort level analysts. Okay, so then we're ready to make the analyze. You have all the cohort level files, the past QC, you do it. And what is made analysis is just taking all these summary statistics for each SNP and combining them into a single estimate. And there are different ways of doing this. On the problem set, we work out two ways of doing fixed effects meta analyses. And the point of the problem is to try to give some intuition for why people do sample size weighting in practice over inverse variance weighting. Inverse variance weighting has the attractive property that it's kind of the theoretically correct thing to do if everything has been measured on the same scale. And if, the, um, um, and if, we, if we know that there's a common parameter that we're estimating in each of the cohorts. Um, but in practice, we don't use it. Um, and the reason is that, or it's, it's, it's sometimes used. I don't want to say it's not, it's, we don't use it. But there are some risks associated with it. And the main risk is that it breaks down if there are differences in scaling across cohorts that we didn't find. So the typical example is your European cohort ran the geos of height measured in centimeters, and the US one did it in inches, and you know, uh, the Dutch one did it in meters. And then um, unless you're very careful with the units, when the results are uploaded, make sure everything is in a common unit. Um, then inverse variance weighting just does horribly. And I think the problem set hopefully clarifies why that is. Um, okay, and then the last couple of minutes, I guess if, if I can have five more minutes, I'm almost done. Um, I want to talk about post-meta QC, yeah? Um, so you usually impose a sample size threshold. So if there was an imputed SNP whose effect was only estimated reliably in say two out of 17 cohorts, then we typically drop it. You know? We impose some kind of cutoff that says, I want, a, I want in order to remain in the final sample, I want, a, um, I want to have summary statistics for the SNP in a sample size of at least 80% of the maximum or something like that. Um, you might impose some imputation accuracy cutoff at this stage, though I would maybe recommend considering doing it even before meta-analyses. And you might want to impose, if you're see, still seeing some funny th 
some funny, suspicious-looking p-values for low math SNPs that you don't completely have faith in, and that maybe don't show up reliably against cohorts, you might want to tighten your math by n threshold. Yeah, Patrick. Would this education accuracy mean in meta-analyzed summary statistics? Oh, no, this is, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, you're right. Um, you can average it across all of them, yeah? And really, this is something that you should do at the level of the, for, this, for the individual genome-wide significant SNPs. So you're right. Thank you for calling me out on that. Um, so, so, so what I, so, so, th so these two are different from this one. This one, what I, what I have in mind, um, is that once you have your genome wide significant hits, you want to take a close look at each one of those, yeah. And one thing you want to do is make sure how, you know, if you have a hit, you should at least how how well imputed was it across my cohorts. If the result seems to be driven by three cohorts, check it, look at those carefully, and see what the imputation accuracy was there. So that's the sense in which imputation accuracy comes in and the in this post-meta stage, okay? Um, okay, and, and this is exactly where I was going next. So for the genome-wide significance hits, look at the imputation accuracy, look at the math, and look at the effect size estimates across course. Make sure there's nothing that stands out to you as odd. Um, now, the, so effect size consistency, for example, is something that you can inspect um, visually through, through so-called forest plots. Um, and you might also want to do something like create a local Manhattan plot around each signal, make sure you have these chimneys that the centenarian paper didn't. Um, so let me just give you an example of a forest plot. So here I purposely picked one that looks a little bit funny, but, I, but this is from, our, I think, EA3, where we had a few thousand significant SNPs. Um, and so one thing that the meta-analysis software will do for you is calculate a p-value where the null is that the effect is the same across all the cohorts. Okay? So this looks like strong evidence against homogeneous effects, but it's not clear that it really is because we had so many hits and I purposefully picked one, picked a forest plot that looked a little bit suspicious, maybe the kind of forest plot that should justify um, some additional um, review before we have confidence in this result. Okay, so, so the p-value is low, unclear what to make of that. What, why is it, what is it about this forest plot that you know, potentially looks a bit suspicious, anybody? So here are the effect size. The reference allele is the same. And these are just confidence intervals. This is the sample sizes. So what, yeah? One cohort has a significantly negative. Yeah, exactly. So the, the results seem to go in opposite directions. We have this heterogeneous P. We have one, two, three, four, where the effect go, is negative. Um, and then we have two smallish cohorts where it's significant in the opposite direction. And it really all seems to be driven by this thing. So what I would do in a case like this is go to the code level files check, are the minor allele frequencies consistent across these cohorts? Now maybe we find that the minor allele frequency is 60% in all the cohorts where the effect was positive and 40% in all the others. And then there's some issue with the reference allele coding again. Maybe, but most likely, and that's what happened in this case, I'm sure, we find that everything is fine and that this is the kind of thing that you shouldn't be su too surprised by if you have a few thousand hits and you're purposefully looking for one that, you know, that looks suspicious, okay? But there are things, you know, in principle, there, there are things that could have gone wrong and that we could detect by looking a bit more carefully. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just want to end with um, a couple of tips or remarks that I didn't comment upon. The first is the order of QC procedures matters a great deal. Like the meaning of being an ancestry outlier obviously depends on um, the sample you use to estimate the PCs and the subject level QC filters that you may have applied earlier to drop some people, you know, now the sample is different. So I haven't said a lot about this. Um, I don't want to imply that you necessarily have to start with the SNP level filters and then go to the subject level filters. If anything, I would, I would suggest that you start with the most, by eliminating the most egregious errors and then work your way downwards sequentially. But that's a subjective judgment. Second is, um, I have often haven't given exact uh, thresholds for QC filters, so that's on purpose. I've tried to convey, you know, the, the, the reason why we have these filters in the first place and then, you know, the, the exact filter that you should apply, I think, really depends on you know, what, what you're trying to do. The third is there are a lot of automated QC, pro QC protocols that you can use. The one that we've relied upon a lot in, in the SSJC is the Easy QC protocol de developed by the Giant um, Consortium. Okay? Um, but whatever you do, my advice is keep manual steps to a minimum because that's where things tend to go wrong. Automate, automate, automate. And don't worry too much about running diagnostics on 10 million SNPs if you can get just as much information from a 10 or a 2% subsample. Um, last thing, 
it's really important to look both at the data, and I recommend a visual diagnostic in, uh, inspection, and log files. And if you see things that look strange, try to get to the bottom of what they are. If you follow these simple steps, I think it's, I think you know your, your QC will work out just fine, and you'll be able to you'll be confident in whatever you find. Okay, that concludes my talk. Thanks.